Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Denison's latest session in our monthly webinar series on reinventing culture through the COVID era. I'm Nellie Stansbury, Denison's Global Brand and Marketing Director, and I'm thrilled to be joined by you all. As we give folks another moment or so to join us, I'd like to encourage you all to utilize the chat and Q&A features below. Please test their functionality by sharing where you're joining us from today. We will be monitoring your questions throughout the session to pose to our speakers at the end of their discussion during Q&A, but our team will also do our best to answer any quick questions throughout the session. Before I turn things over to the team, I'd like to briefly overview the Denison Consulting Firm and what we do and introduce today's speakers. While many of you are likely familiar with us, I'd like to give an overview of our firm and what we do. Denison Consulting is a firm focused on large-scale culture transformation and leadership development, headquartered in Ann Arbor, Michigan, with a European office based outside of Zurich, Switzerland. With over 20 years of experience and over 10,000 clients, our global reach has allowed us to develop world-class research and diagnostics and do work in over 50 countries. I'd like to now introduce today's speakers. Today, I'm joined by several members of the Denison team, Michael Schwendeman, Guy Trepandit, Austin Adams, and Margaret Corman. Michael Schwendeman is Denison's Director of Research and Development. Lauren is not joining us today, but I did want to highlight her for her contributions to today's session. Guy Trepandit is Denison's Enterpri Enterprise Solutions Productization Director. Austin Adams is Denison's Director of Innovation. Margaret Gorman is Denison's VP of Sales and Marketing. And lastly, I'm Nellie Stainsbury, Denison's Global Brand and Marketing Director. I'd like to now turn things over to Michael to kick things off. All right, thanks so much, Nellie. And, and welcome everyone, we're glad you're here. Uh, so today we, we really wanted to walk through some of the findings that we've been seeing, some of the insights that we've pulled from the data that we've been collecting over the course of the last few years during COVID. And so today's agenda is really about exploring the trends that we've seen in culture throughout COVID and discussing some of the key insights that we've pulled from that. Uh, and we'll walk through each of these in depth, starting with an overview of, of what we found. So diving right in to, to those culture trends through COVID. Uh, for those uh, that may not be as familiar with us, uh, we've, we've been collecting culture data over the past two years about the culture of organizations during the pandemic. And our research team has analyzed trends in the COVID era, uh, which is generally the years of 2020 and 2021, uh, to serve as insights about how organizations have been changing throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, because the data, data available to us at Denison is, is just really a fraction of the research done during this time, we're also integrating other research and client stories to support and extend what we've been seeing in our data. Uh, for those that are, are less familiar with the model, I'll walk through that briefly so that you're familiar with it and that things make sense as we continue to speak to them. Uh, so the model itself is based on four traits. Mission, the red quadrant on the top right, refers to the direction and purpose of the organization, answering question, where are we going? Consistency in the yellow on the bottom right refers to the systems, structures, and processes that make the organization function. How do we create leverage? The trait in the green on the bottom left is involvement and refers to commitment, ownership, and responsibility of employees. Are our people aligned and engaged? And finally, in the top left in blue is adaptability, which refers to external facing sides of the business and its ability to react quickly. Are we listening to the marketplace? So throughout the webinar today, if you see one of these four colors, uh, it refers back to that given trait and the data that represents it. So, at an overall level, uh, just looking at the very high level trends, throughout the course of the pandemic, culture scores actually generally got stronger in the early stages of the pandemic and have since leveled out a bit and returned to that pre-pandemic level throughout the course of 2021. And really at the onset of the pandemic in those first few months, uh, it was really characterized by fear, confusion, uncertainty for many about both their professional lives and, and how they work, as well as their personal lives. Uh, however, following the beginning phases, those first few months, we found that culture scores generally grew throughout the year uh, of 2020 as organizations stepped up in the face of the pandemic and clarified and aligned around new ways of working. And as we look into 2021, culture scores have since regressed a bit back towards pre-pandemic levels. And as organizations try to figure out how to internalize the learnings that 
uh, that they experienced during the pandemic and also bounce forward and integrate those into how they work. But we do see that those levels are still above average from what we saw before the pandemic. As we look more specifically at some of those indexes and items, uh, the, the high level trends that we see have many, many layers of insights about specific aspects of culture that have shifted during the pandemic. We looked at the highest scores during this time, creating change stands out as the area where organizations were strongest. During times of crisis and disruption, they really had no choice but to adapt and to create change rapidly and effectively. Uh, and the, the data were supporting that. Second strongest area we saw was empowerment, an aspect of culture that's really closely associated with creating change. Organizations had to keep employees informed and delegate decision-making effectively so that they could be agile and create change as the disruption was occurring. A bit surprising to us, coordination and integration was the third strongest index followed closely by team orientation. Uh, these aspects of collaboration indicated that organizations adapted quickly to the new ways of working and often these new ways of working were in that virtual or hybrid setting. Uh, and the data supported the fact that organizations made this transfer fairly quickly and, and fairly, fairly seamlessly. And these were areas of strength throughout the course of the pandemic. One aspect of culture that lagged behind the rest was core values, uh, suggesting that some organizations may have lost sight of reinforcing their values in the context of the pandemic, as they were focused on survival mode and focused on operations. Uh, core values may have been something that uh, had less focus during this time. So next we'll, we'll dig into each of these key areas and offer insights into why these trends may exist. So starting out kind of at the top, Insight number one, change readiness is vital. Uh, the disruption that the pandemic caused was much less significant for organizations that were adaptable and robust internal capabilities of their workforce and their people. These things became so important during the pandemic as that disruption occurred and, and people had to shift the ways they worked very quickly. And creating change was the strongest index that we saw. Uh, was the most improved index from pre-pandemic levels, and it also had included the top two overall items based on the data. So different parts of the organization often cooperate to create change, and the way things done is very flexible and easy to change. So as we think about how pandemic or how the pandemic has influenced organizations, this is fairly intuitive, where cultures that promoted flexibility and adaptability were in a good place when the pandemic hit to be able to react to it quickly. Others were uh, forced to, to get there very quickly. Uh, and, and it's easy to think of many examples uh, of this, these agile innovations that occurred. Uh, B2C industries like food and beverage shifted to touchless service and an increase in the use of mobile apps, such as restaurants, expanding their delivery services and quickly moving and creating more outdoor space. Uh, Dyson was a great example where they designed a new ventilator in 10 days, something that was pretty unheard of before that point, but when you're pushed to the brink during a crisis, uh, you find some of the best innovation occurs during that time. Uh, we've also look, worked very closely with, with a client in their effort to become more ready for change, uh, and Austin can speak to that a little bit more. Yeah, thank you, Michael. Um, so we had done a future of work initiative sort of during the swing of the pandemic um, that was sort of uh, designed to both understand a lot of changes that the organization was seeing, a uh, federal agency organization, uh, as well as helping them uh, make shifts out of uh, sort of the, the structure that they had existed within. And um, there's sort of two key things that we learned from that work. And uh, the, the biggest piece of that is uh, coupling change readiness with willingness to change. And we uh, found a lot of uh, resistance um, to, to change. And part of that is, uh, to some of the points Michael's made here, um, change readiness and, and making change in times of, uh, of stress, and, and as we saw through the pandemic, uh, crisis more so, uh, it requires that you decentralize authority. Um, and it also requires a lot of resources. Um, and, and because of that, uh, we often uh, see a, a bit of resistance to change, even when the organization has the tools in place to do so. Um, and so change willingness uh, proved to be just as important. Um, and we found that uh, that linked to things like uh, trust and accountability, um, that 
supervisors trusting the people below them allowed them to uh, delegate authority more easily, uh, but also uh, in the relationships that people had. Uh, people had uh, significant relationships before the pandemic that they were able to leverage uh, to better communicate, but also uh, to have a little bit more understanding around uh, individual situations. And so um, being able to foster the relationships that uh, people have, uh, as well as being able to empower them with L&D to lead and uh, have, foster a sort of sense of trust and accountability uh, really allows for uh, mobilization of your workforce in times of change, uh, which goes a little bit beyond um, change readiness and, and goes into sort of the mindset of your workforce and, and how they enact change and their willingness to do so. Thanks, Austin. And, and we really found that when, when we looked at our own research and, and we compared it to research from numerous other organizations, there's countless examples of how agile organizations have outperformed others in adapting during COVID-19. And not just agile organizations, but the business units, the teams within those organizations that are the most agile were the ones that were able to succeed the most. Uh, here, one such study showed how key metrics like customer satisfaction, employee engagement, operational performance, uh, these were all areas that were far stronger for business units that had already adopted an agile model before the onset of the pandemic. Uh, and another example from, from that same client was within one specific group that typically serves communities dealing with natural disasters, uh, that group became really a model for coordinating and integrating as other parts of the organization were forced into similar scenarios. Uh, they were used to being very agile and responding to uncertain ambiguous uh, situations and, and scenarios and their experience with that rapid change had prepared them to be agile in the face of the pandemic as well. They became leaders for change within the organization and, and really a good model of best practice of how to react to, to the rest of the organization. Other research has, has drilled down into the specific elements that enable agility within organizations. Uh, those are broken, broken out into team level elements and enterprise level elements. So at the team level, agile teams were able to shift quickly and work efficiently because they were aware of the capabilities of their team members and were able to rally necessary skills around tasks to keep work moving. So engaging and enabling employees to have that agile mindset was key encouraging the workforce to test, to learn, to adapt to the new systems uh, and reinvent the systems that they had was important as well. And then also developing workforces that were focusing on the speed of innovation during normal times as well as pandemic times. So particularly now as we're coming hopefully out of the pandemic and, and thinking about how we're integrating what we've learned and what we've how we've been practicing into our normal work, uh, it requires that of efficient and effective communication and cross-functional collaboration to be able to make that happen efficiently. At the enterprise level, empowerment was a key area as well, where cross-functional teams uh, at the lowest level were encouraged to step up and make decisions when they were coping with the shock, coping with the crisis. Uh, and reducing uncertainty through information sharing was key at this time as well. And that feeds right into our second main insight uh, of, of that second strongest area that we saw during COVID of empowerment. So empowerment, while it's always been an important aspect of a high functioning culture, the pandemic introduced a unique setting and with it unique challenges to empowering employees. Many organizations had quickly shifted to remote work and empowering employees meant trusting them to deliver, maybe in a setting where you weren't able to informally drop in and check in on them. Uh, organizations that excelled during the pandemic were able to support employees by creating that psychologically safe environment where they were empowered to make those decisions. Uh, and that empowerment meant uh, sharing necessary information with them. It meant clarifying boundaries of risk taking and encouraging that innovation and in learning. Uh, and if teams are able to be agile and create change effectively, they have to be empowered to make those decisions themselves. And so that aspect of empowerment is something that organizations did thrive in and, and were pushed in during the pandemic. And similarly, other research has, has dug into this space as well, expanding on this trend of, of decision-making and how empowering employees requires 
not just delegating that authority to make decisions, but also enabling them, supporting them in the decisions that they make by sharing information, primarily on what kinds of decisions there are. And so out of McKinsey came this research that focused on these different aspects of decision, making, these different types of decisions. And for leaders that are empowering their teammates to, to make these decisions, it's really about a balance between providing adequate support and empowering employees, but also avoiding the extremes too much of either providing too much support and direction and micromanaging or not enough support and kind of cheerleading from the sidelines or having that laissez-faire leadership style where they're not engaged enough and not effective at enabling their employees to make those decisions. And empowerment can really benefit employees a lot beyond just the quality of the decisions that are being made. Empowerment's been shown to be a mechanism through which burnout and emotional exhaustion can be mitigated. And those are key areas that uh, organizations have begun focusing on more, more often uh, during the pandemic. And empowerment, keeping employees highly engaged can also help fend off a lot of the Great Recession, the what we've seen of employees leaving jobs in the highest numbers that we've ever seen in unprecedented numbers. And so it's really up to leaders and how they're able to engage their employees, empower their employees to continue being involved in their work and being able to make the decisions that they have the best information to make. That third area that we saw were kind of the next two levels uh, of the strongest aspects of culture were coordination and integration and team orientation. And while both creating change and empowerment had really become inevitable outcomes of the pandemic, areas that organizations were forced to step up in, coordination, integration, and team orientation are two of the areas that were often decidedly more difficult as organizations transitioned to remote work models and working in, in new places and working virtually more often than they had been before. Uh, and our research suggests that organizations took these changes in stride. Uh, as, as you look towards the items that referenced different parts of the organization in our culture survey, these were the ones that were among the most improved compared to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and whether that cross-functional connection was in service of creating change, uh, whether it was about coordinating on projects, whether it was about cooperating uh, with teammates and with cross-functional leaders, uh, it was remarkable how coordination and communication were enhanced as normal methods of disruption or normal methods of communication and transportation, communication and coordination were disrupted. Uh, the, the all hands meetings, the informal drop-ins, the water cooler talks, those weren't available, but people have found ways to really still thrive in communicating with one another uh, at really out of necessity. And, and much like empowerment, these aspects of culture are really a necessary foundation for agile teams and enterprises to be successful. You can't be able to adapt quickly without communicating and coordinating with, with those peers, those on your team. Uh, and Austin can also expand on, on how this really played out with that same client in their, in their change efforts. Yeah, thanks, Michael. Uh, so again, two key points here. Uh, the, the first one really being, and again, for context, this was done uh, within the context of a future of work initiative. Uh, but the, a key lesson that we learned is uh, you, you will not see a lot of success by taking systems that existed in person and shoving them into a digital space. And it, it really requires sort of a reconceptualization of how you communicate for what reasons and when. And so uh, we had started with the client who um, did sort of a migration to uh, any sort of messaging softwares they could find. And uh, again, they, there was not a lot of sort of intentional consideration behind uh, the sort of mechanisms of communication and when they should be used. And so uh, by, by being more intentional about the uh, communication and coordination structure as it existed online, they were able to uh, improve their communication very quickly, which was integral for them to be able to make such a major pivot during the pandemic. Uh, the other thing that we learned um, that I, I think is sort of connected to that, um, but it's about sort of the uh, taking successful norms and practices and having a strong enough uh, coordination system to be able to bring those to the rest of your organization. And so to what we learned uh, and to, to a chart that Michael had shown, 
um, earlier around change readiness is that uh, many factions within your organization are much more prepared uh, for this type of change than others. And so by having str your, a strong ability to coordinate and communicate across your organization, uh, you can learn about uh, successful norms and practices and uh, sort of uh, take those things and spread them across the organization to other areas where they may be effective, uh, effectively expediting uh, the amount of change that you can handle uh, and, and doing so without requiring people to sort of uh, self-learn a new process and implement it themselves. And so, uh, again, coordination and communication uh, really critical as uh, a tool for change. Yeah, thanks, Austin. And and that that was one example of, of really a large organization that that found itself having to in, integrate what they've done with other parts of the business, communicate really effectively, uh, and as they were thinking about building out their future work. And and we've seen this similar type of thing in in the research that we've seen in other sources as well. The the ways that emphasizing the importance of collaboration in times of crisis is key to, to the business performance and, and to certain employee outcomes. And one such study, again, used a crisis that has happened in the past to, to really share how this has happened. Uh, and so that financial crisis in 2008 was used as a comparable example of how effective collaboration can lead to better business performance in times of rapid change. And, and times of uncertainty and volatility. Uh, collaborative partners in this global law firm outperformed their colleagues both during the crisis as well as in the years following the crisis, uh, really pointing to the fact that that collaboration is definitely a key piece when, when uncertainty increases, uh, but is also something that needs to be ingrained in, into the culture of a workforce to be, a, to be able to be effective. Uh, research also emphasized how Multiple methods of communication were important to establish, including top-down communication from senior leaders. That's something that was really, really important early on in the pandemic of making sure that people had some information uh, or were informed about some of the decisions that were being made. Uh, but also that cross-functional communication was really key and important of information sharing across teams during these times of uncertainty. So these, these communications helped keep employees informed so that they can make better decisions and it helped mitigate a lot of the stress of those ambiguous environments. Uh, however, two-way communication is always also important uh, with that bottom-up piece of communication. And, it, and that can be substantially harder to do in a virtual or hybrid environment. And organizations have to be explicit about listening to their employees and collecting feedback. Uh, and this occurred with a client of ours over the past year who were very effective at that top-down communication piece, partially out of necessity, while they were in survival mode during the pandemic and keeping employees informed about what was going on. Uh, but as we've moved into uh, kind of the stages of coming out of the pandemic, uh, they've been met with some resistance recently as employees are seeking more of a voice in how the strategic initiatives and changes that have been put in place uh, are connected to their own day-to-day -day job and, and how they affect the work that they do. And many of the leaders in this organization are results driven, uh, really individualistic type of environment. Uh, and sometimes that can be at the expense of caring for employees. And, and the plan moving forward with this organization is really to incorporate more coaching and more feedback in the leadership development process so that they can hear from their teams and their peers about how their leadership and, and how their behavior is impacting the culture around them. Uh, the, the fourth area uh, that we looked at is, was really about those mission uh, indexes and, and those areas of mission that were strong as well as those that were kind of lagging behind. Uh, as we saw with, with those first three areas, these were areas that organizations really stepped up in and we saw a lot of organizations thrive uh, in, in the way that they were able to adapt quickly the way that they empowered their employees, the way that they coordinated and communicated. Uh, mission was kind of more of a mixed bag. Uh, we saw items within this, uh, within this area ranging from 50, about clearly stating objectives, all the way up to 96 or 69, uh, about meeting short-term demands. And that, that one was actually one of the top five overall. And so we saw quite a large spread. Uh, and this illustrates really the split between strong perceptions of short-term focus 
with weaker perceptions of long-term goals and strategy. And this was particularly true for data that we saw in 2021. Uh, so organizations have often excelled at finding ways to get work done over the last couple of years, but many have been forced to throw out that five-year plan and rethink strategy and goals. And then this was a consistent message we heard from clients throughout last year who found they needed to recalibrate strategy on a more regular basis as that half-life of strategic planning had shrunk. And an evident example of this is how, if you think back to, to last year, the return to office plan that each organization came out with had to, if it wasn't suspended indefinitely, it was one that had to change repeatedly month to month. Uh, and, and organizations had to really adapt their strategy far more often than they typically do. Uh, and this distinction between long-term strategy and ongoing strategizing was also expanded on by, by our consulting team last year. And, and Margaret can speak to that a little bit better. Yeah, some of you might have joined us um, in July when Brian Atkins, one of our senior consultants, shared out what you know some trending that we were seeing um, in this shift from you know a long-term you know linear strategic planning process to more of an ongoing strategizing um, and building in this notion of quarterly recalibrations and just you know. So the idea of you know tracking the progress, uh, adjusting it, recalibrating it, and as Michael stated, you know their um, lack of uh, uh, the challenges with an uncertain environment and being able to predict policies and practices and just having to continue to readjust it. So we're really finding with our the clients that we're working with, they're really looking for new and different models uh, around a more dynamic. Um, emergent um, and involving strategizing process. We're happy to share that. It's also on our uh, website, the uh, recording from that session this, uh, this summer. Yeah, thank, thanks, Margaret. So, so this is something that, that we've been hearing a lot from clients, over the, especially over the last year, uh, as they think about moving forward, how are we going to be integrating and changing uh, based on the disruption that the pandemic has caused. Uh, and so, so that long-term planning process has been condensed. And this is something that we've also seen uh, in external research as well. So organizations that were able to rapidly reinvent themselves during the pandemic can really provide good lessons on resilience. Uh, and that applies to strategy as well. Uh, and so from research from MIT Sloan, we saw that when they asked a panel of strategy experts across the globe how setting goals and objectives and strategizing as a company changed as a result of the pandemic, they found that the majority of respondents agreed that the pandemic has permanently changed how they should think about business strategy. And if organizations have strategic and operational agility, they're better equipped to handle volatile and rapidly changing environments. And that's definitely been the case over the past couple of years. And is, is more going to be integrated into the environment that businesses are functioning in uh, into the future. Uh, additionally, based on a, a survey of 300 senior executives asking about strategic planning efforts, uh, McKinsey found that roughly half reported the crisis exposed weaknesses in their company strategy, and that there were opportunities to improve this, the business based on the pandemic's disruption. And this was in areas like improving cost, like improving customer experience, uh, as supply chains have, have really been challenged during this time, as the way organizations interact with their customers has really been challenged, uh, there are opportunities to change strategy and think about ways that this disruption can be used to improve those strategies moving forward. Uh, these, the, the research here also suggested that strategic planning processes have to be flexible enough to deal with high uncertainty. And, and pointed to a few aspects that were really important to being and to enabling uh, that flexibility. And one was setting bold aspirations, but with the context of resetting long-term strategy and communicating those changes to employees on a regular basis. Uh, and that, that communication aspect uh, comes in really important here in strategy too, as organizations do make those types of changes it requires at times a pivot from the entire organization and the ways that people work changes. And so having that clear communication is key to making sure that the, the execution of that strategy, the implementation of that strategy is also effective. 
Uh, and that, that was another piece that they spoke about as well as shortening strategy implementation timeframes to allow for faster iteration of plans. And so while in the past it may have been a longer term strategy was executed on a longer term, uh, these organizations and leaders are thinking that strategy implementation needs to happen quicker. And we need to know if we're hitting you know, the, the key metrics that we want in, in, in that strategy. And we need to get that information back quickly to know if we need to change. And so strategy and, and mission more generally was another area that was uh, a mixed bag and, and one that had strengths and weaknesses throughout the course of the pandemic. Finally, the, the fifth area that we've seen in, in one of these last trends is upholding core values it has been a real challenge throughout the course of the pandemic. Uh, and while many of these trends in the data illustrate the resilience of organizations and the ways that they've rallied around culture to survive and thrive in areas of like creating change, like empowerment and coordination, one aspect of culture that has consistently lagged behind during this time has been core values. Uh, this was the lowest index during the COVID era. If you look at that circumplex on the bottom right, it's the only one that's less than that 50th percentile. Uh, and it also had um, two of the lowest items uh, from the entire survey were in that core values index. Ethno, there is an ethical code that guides our behavior and tells us right from wrong. And when people ignore core values, they are held accountable. And so this area of culture is really about representing those non-negotiables within the organization, uh, who, who you are and what you represent, what you stand for. And these past two years have led to challenges that forced many organizations to focus on day-to-day -day survival. And, and for many that meant a lesser focus on the values of the organization and whether the behavior of leaders, the behavior of employees reflected those values. Uh, and also, if you think about it beyond the pandemic and the influence of the pandemic, there have been other aspects of you know, social pressures uh, and social events that have happened over the past two years that have influenced an area like core values. And, and so what HBR referred to as corporate social justice, this was an area that became far more prominent uh, in the wake of the death of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, and it pushed organizations to take an outward stance denouncing injustice. Uh, and it also forced them to look inward and, and cultivate that equity within their own organization. Uh, and core values became a piece of that as well of how do we integrate inclusion and diversity and equity into our core values and into the way we work as an organization. Uh, great resignation was also another piece of this where and if an employee found that they didn't have core values that aligned with an organization, they they felt far more comfortable leaving that organization during this time. Uh, and on the flip side of that, organizations that uh, that had strong, strong core values and that aligned with the values of others, they could use that as a competitive advantage in the job market as well, where organizations are going to need to be winning back workers and convincing workers uh, to come work for their organization in the new talent market. Uh, finally, sustainability was another piece that uh, as there have been greater and greater focuses and pledges to being sustainable and greater focus on the impact an organization has on the environment, uh, there's been increasing pressure to be accountable for that long-term impact and of the organizational practices. And so core values is an area that has certainly been affected by the pandemic, but there are other aspects of what's been going on throughout the course of the last two years that have impacted this. And as we think about reinventing culture through the COVID era, these types of influences must be considered as well of, of how they've impacted the data trends that we've seen and how they've impacted actual experiences within organizations. And, and Gayatri actually has an example or two of how this has played out with some of our clients. Thank you, Michael. Um, the lower core value scores are particularly noteworthy for us given the increase in trends for empowerment and employee perception of cooper co cooperation, team orientation, et cetera. Um, a premier North American energy solutions company had high overall scores across all trades, but saw a dip in their core values um, over the COVID era. The index was still high compared to the benchmark, but given the other indices, the dip was notable. This was a real shift in the way employees understood the ethics or core values and saw how they were being modeled and enforced by their leaders. And as we engage with this client over a period of time, 
we, as part of their action planning, we saw this organization discussing a rewarding or rethinking of their core values and adding um, capability development or adding um, leadership element or customer driven focus as part of their core values. Another example is from a healthcare technology and research organization. Um, the, the overall scores uh, were improving, but core values remained low. Given the healthcare and research related mission of this organization during the COVID era, the core values remaining low during this time was particularly interesting and the organization has been thinking through what that means for the organization as a whole. Um, and we've seen, um, to go to the next slide, we've seen some indicators for um, how, what core values mean for organizations. We found core values to be important to organizations for different reasons, as you might imagine. Employee experience, the internal focus, satisfaction, employee satisfaction, co commitment are one category of uh, significance. And the other, it tends to be the external competitive advantage. Um, the benchmark data themes about core values appear to be supported by what we're seeing across um, external sources in that they are indicative of the self-reflection that employees seem to have undertaken about what matters to them and what that means for work as uh, Michael was also referencing. Generally speaking, this is, um, this is an area of focus, perhaps concern for organizations because it means employees appear to be questioning their alignment to their organization. Um, a 2020 Gallup survey found that only 27% of employees strongly believe in their organization's core values. And it appears that many organizations seem to have fallen short in their implementation of their core values, which is a crucial step to gaining employee buy-in and ensuring that core values are being embraced across the organization. So we're seeing organizations, as uh, Michael mentioned, the great resignation, we're seeing the, this exodus of employees who are exhausted and overwhelmed and questioning and thinking about what, what their work truly means. But we're also seeing that this has led to inherent opportunities, especially in the drive to build in values as part of the strategy or to consider employee experience as a priority. Um, we're seeing organizations contemplating how they would operationalize the democratization of employee experience um, that allows employees to practice their empowerment or rethinking the effectiveness of a top-down leadership approach to culture, but not relegating that culture building to this ambiguous experience, but holding individuals or roles accountable for this bottom-up build or investing in technologies that offer that empowerment boost. All of this indicates a willingness of organizations to consider um, ways to engage employees, to democratize their experience. Um, there are also indicators, as I mentioned in my example, that this might be a good time, regardless of the inconsistency of the future of work, to rethink and review organizational core values. Um, our other sources so show that organizations' core values are impacting their competitive advantage. And this goes to, this speaks to a lot of that, uh, a lot of the examples that Michael was also referencing. Um, consumer behaviors are being dri driven by their beliefs and assumptions. Consumers are buying goods and services from organizations that reflect their personal beliefs and values. Um, and organizations, we've seen organizations begin to give more attention to these concerns about culture, to think through what needs to be reflected on where they stand on issues like DEIA or sustainability and how core values can be built into strategy and applied consistently. Right, yeah, the core values is, is a, an area that's been impacting a lot of aspects of the business, whether it's, it's the consumer and, and how they view the organization, whether it's employees at the organization, whether it's the job market. Uh, in core values is, is becoming more and more of a focus and, and more and more of a, an aspect of the organization that can't be ignored. Uh, and, and what we found over the course of the last few years, and even before that, when, when we think about core values, it's really that accountability piece that's the hardest. Uh, it's not just what do we stand for, but 
do people's behavior actually align with that? And, and do we hold people accountable when their behaviors do not align with that? And, and that's organizations that can achieve that accountability are those that really have that strong core value culture uh, within the organization. And so, so this again is an area that, that was different than many of the other trends that we saw in the data. Uh, one that, that stood out as, as really lagging behind as the operational focus and, and the culture that enabled that operational focus during the survival mode of the pandemic uh, really led to, to a lot of resilience in organizations and a lot of strengths, but this was one that, that was lagging behind during that time. So looking at, at kind of tying this together and, and looking towards the future and, and how rather than bouncing back from the pandemic, we can think about how we're bouncing forward. It's really about building on the good aspects of, of what we've seen in these trends of what organizations have stepped up to do uh, and rethinking those areas that have lagged behind uh, and internalizing those learnings of, of the areas that have excelled, creating change, empowerment, coordination. Uh, we really need to ask ourselves the questions of, of how do we integrate agility into our everyday culture and how do we enable our people, our teams to be more agile on a regular basis. Uh, one aspect of that clearly, how do we effectively empower our people and how do we make sure that decision making power is in their hands, that they have the information that they need and the authority they need to make those decisions quickly and effectively. And also, how do we establish and improve effective collaboration across the organization? Uh, that may mean new methods of communication, new types of, of regular touch, touch bases and check-ins, uh, new types of teams and how teams work together. Uh, it's, it's about integrating those learnings and, and that the disruption has caused and, and making sure that we can make that part of the culture moving forward, not just something that, that we did in the face of the crisis, but re reverting back to old ways uh, following the pandemic. And on the flip side, it may be time to revisit some of those other areas, revisit core values, re rethink long-term mission and strategizing to maintain that competitive advantage. So have we been holding our people accountable to core values? And are our strategy and goals still on target and do they resonate with our people uh, in, in the context of coming out of the pandemic and in, in the context of kind of the wake of this great resignation? And, and how can we make sure that those are aligned uh, at high levels of the organization and across the organization so that people know how the core values, how the strategy impact their day-to-day -day role and, and the extent to which they're aligned on that and bought in on that for the sake of the organization. And so as, as organizations have, have created change at higher levels than ever before, it's really about how do we internalize these learnings? How do we reinvent ourselves for the future? Uh, and as we look towards reinventing culture in the COVID era, uh, and beyond, it's it's about paying attention to these different aspects of change that have occurred and trying to leverage them the best way possible. And so, at this point, I, I think we've we've left ample time here for questions, uh, which which doesn't always happen. And so we're happy to do that. I know there's been a chat ongoing um, that that's been very lively, and we appreciate that. But Nelly, I'll, I'll pass it back over to you. To have there been any questions that that haven't been answered or that we want to speak to during this discussion point? Yeah, I think there's one or two that we can speak to, but as Michael said, our team has been answering throughout the session. So if you haven't had a chance to ask your question and you had a question, that would be a great time. Um, we would love to do our best to answer for you. I did have a question around the sectors included in compiling these insights um, and specifically if they included the nonprofit sector as well. Sure. So, so that's actually actually one of the slides that we had in the appendix in, in case people were wondering about that. And so, so here we have a breakdown of, of the industry representation as well as the headquarter region that those organizations uh, come from. And, and what we found is by and large, it, it reflects what we have in our global benchmark, the types of organizations we've regularly worked with and uh, nonprofits and particularly NGOs uh, we're, we're an area that we worked with quite a bit uh, during this time. And so that's definitely well represented here. Uh, there were certainly industries that we worked with less often during this time. Uh, food and beverage was, was an area about that accommodation and food services 
Uh, we only worked with one organization in the past couple of years uh, about that. Uh, and, and I will mention also the, the inclusion criteria for this type of analysis is that it was an organization who first took their survey during this time. Uh, and so that's what's represented in, in the charts here. Awesome, thanks. I have another question that just popped up in the Q&A. Um, why do you think that the ratings of core values are typically so low? Yeah, it's a great question. Anyone else want to answer that one, Kaitra? Yeah, um, we have um, so it, the ratings. The ratings that we we registered and uh, for I'll also defer to you, Michael, for your depth of expertise within the data. But the there were changes going on within organizations that. Perhaps, and in addition to the changes that we're all seeing externally that are partly COVID driven and partly socially driven, um, seem to combine and impact the collective core value, um, core value um, scores. And the data that we, the sources that we looked at externally, other research seem to support that. and. Uh, and in, in, in this case, I think I'm making an informed assumption that the core values are reflecting employees questioning of what, where they want to work, the type of work they want to perform, not to mention the, the impact of preference of how they do the work, the preference for hybrid, just thinking of what future work means, what organization designs are going to mean that help um, employees really practice this empowerment. So. Um, in the cases that we've seen, um, the core the core values seemed to be impacted by changes that were happening in the organization. And I'll let Michael, I, I, if you have more experience with the yeah, definitely. And and I, I think when we seek to understand some of these trends, it, it always helps to go back to what are the items in the survey that are speaking to these topics and. There's an ethical code that guides our behavior and tells us right from wrong. When people ignore core values, they are held accountable. Those were the two items within the index that, that were really lagging behind the most uh, and, and may speak to the fact that the attention was kind of shifted away from, uh, from core values and, and being kind of standing by the values of the organization, making sure that they're visible in everyday uh, behaviors. Uh, as, as people were focused on survival mode. And I think that's one that is, is more salient now than ever as, as people are really thinking about, is this an organization that aligns well with my values? And, and we've seen or employees at organizations leave at record numbers when, when the answer may be no. And so it's understanding kind of the, the data and, and the items and how people are perceiving these different aspects of core values really helps answer the question of, of why, why we may be seeing these trends and what that means for moving forward in the future. Yeah, and someone just contributed sort of uh, mirroring that thought that employees seem to be disillusioned with the idea of values, but what really counts in, in their opinions are the observable behaviors, which I think speaks to what you were just saying, Michael. Um, I have two more questions that just came in. Does Denison assess how individual employees' values are aligned with the organizational culture? And if so, how do we do that? So I'd say the way we measure core values is more about organizational perspective uh, and how employees perceive the organization uh, and the specific items within that core value index really speak to that. The other two that, that wouldn't be there are about whether leaders and managers are practicing what they preach. Uh, that was one that one aspect of core values that didn't lag behind quite as much. And, and so maybe speaks to a more positive aspect of behaviors within an organization. Uh, and then, and, and so I'd say it's less about how individuals uh, core values align with the organization and more about organizational values and individuals perceptions of those. Awesome, thank you. And we just got another 
Someone just wrote in the Q&A. Um, I assume these ratings are means, but in respect to ranges, have you witnessed organizations who have done better around core values and how has that affected their organizational results, uh, maybe in respect to the great resignation? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so when, when we're looking at the, the data here, we're looking at both means as well as percentiles. And, and those percentiles are what's benchmarked against uh, the, the rest of the organizations that have taken the survey. And that, that really allows us to be able to compare items directly to one another and, and has a less of an impact on the specific ways that item is worded uh, and how people respond based on the wording of a given item. And so, so the way that the data is reflected is, is in percentiles and, and compared to that global benchmark. Uh, but uh, Nelly, remind me of that, the second half of that question there. Let me pull it up, sorry. Um, have you witnessed organizations who have done better around core values and how has that affected their organizational results and maybe in respect to the great resignation? Right, yeah, that's that's a great question. And, uh, and, and Gayatri had, had an example of an organization where the core values were lagging behind a bit um, as and, and we're likely still improving, but not at the pace of the rest of the aspects of culture. And, and I think that's kind of emblematic of what we've seen in the data here of core values is an area that it's, it's not decreasing. People aren't saying that core values are getting worse and, and perceptions are declining and becoming more negative of core values, but it's just not keeping up with the pace of the rest of the culture of the organization and how it's improving. Uh, and I think uh, I, I don't know if I have specific examples um, of, of how that's played out for our clients, um, but Margaret, Gayatri, Austin, can you think of specific examples of clients we work with where that's occurred, where core values has maybe lagged behind or even gone in, in the opposite direction? You know, we have uh, uh, one of our client organizations. It's actually a European-based um, organization with global um, locations, and they ha also have locations in the U.S., um, geographically dispersed. They actually saw an increase during COVID, which is what Michael's speaking to. Core values in relation to the other indices has tended to be a little bit lower, but did show an increase during COVID. And so they also saw that. Um, and during their action planning, they were trying and their honest conversations, which is part of the post-diagnosis process. You know, they were trying to understand more about what could they be doing so that their employees felt an understanding of what the organization is trying to do, you know, and changes in industry and adjustments uh, given the uncertainty. And so that is one potential contribution that this particular global organization has seen as a, as a positive. Um, they saw some real intentionality um, in their leadership in taking actions and actually prioritizing, even doing like a cultural diagnosis and other you know, engagement platforms. Right, and, and oftentimes in, in the core values work we do with clients, it is about the behaviors and, and whether the behaviors of people are aligned with core values and whether people are held accountable if they aren't. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of our items speak to and a lot of the kind of honest conversations that follow uh, with the data are, are speaking about is about those behaviors. We probably have time for one or two more questions. Just got one. And I know that there's probably no definitive answer on this right now, as this is an ongoing thing that, that people are experiencing, but to what extent has being mostly remote or hybrid impacted overall employee perceptions of culture? And the follow-up question is, is remote work really as ideal as employees are reporting, which I think is subjective in, in many cases, but Michael, if you could speak to that a little. Yeah, sure thing. So. I think that being the context of, of all of the data that we've been collecting over the past couple of years, the fact that people are remote and virtual more often than not uh, was, was really surprising for some of the results that we were seeing. Uh, 
uh, coordination and integration in particular was an area that we, we thought that would be challenging, more challenging uh, in the case of the pandemic, in a case of being more virtual, but it was one that was actually, uh, you know, among the strongest areas of culture that we saw. And, and I think having, having that influence and, and seeing the trends that we did see and really spoke to some of the examples that across our clients that we have seen of, in many ways, it, it put people kind of on a level playing field of, you know, at Denison even, we have consultants, internal consultants with Denison that are located in different parts of the United States. And it's just as easy to talk to them as it is to talk to anyone else now. And so the the, the playing field was leveled and, and you were able to make those connections in a more consistent way with different people across the organization. Um, I think a lot of organizations also implemented kind of new practices to be able to stay more connected and be more intentional about making those connections happen. Uh, whether that's kind of a daily meeting in the morning with your supervisor, uh, or, or more regular group meetings or more intentional cross-functional meetings, uh, those, those modes of communication and, and the cadence of those communications became something organizations had to be really intentional about. Uh, and I think just based on the data trends that we've seen, it points to the fact that organizations have done that fairly well and that employee perceptions of those types of aspects of the culture have been fairly positive. Thanks, Michael. I think um, I know our team is answering one or two more questions directly in the Q and A, but I think we might now might be a good time to wrap up. Um, if you go to the next slide, Michael, I just wanted to share some of our upcoming events, which does include our global forum. You'll see at the top um, that is on May 11th and 12th from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Eastern time, and the registration is free. I am going to drop that in the chat for everyone. We would love to have you there. And, and this will also include client stories talking about some of these trends and how they've played out among their organizations in, in the past two years and in the work that they've done with us prior to that as well. But we also have some other events upcoming. Our 2022 certification workshops are listed there for the remainder of the year and a link to um, register for those specific workshops. Our monthly webinar series will continue starting in July. And then we also have some resources listed for our website, but that's it for, for our team. And I just wanted to give a huge thank you to Michael Guytree, Margaret Austin, for all of your work on this and for sharing today. And a big thank you to everyone who took the time to join us. Um, Michael, Margaret Guytree, Austin, any closing words other than thanking everyone for their time? No, I think definitely thank, thanks for coming. Thanks for listening. Um, and thanks for your feedback. Having an engaging chat really helps with, with the dialogue around this. And, and I will say, definitely sign up for that global forum that May 11th and 12th may seem far away out, but it's only like five weeks away. Uh, and that's the client stories is, is really, I, I know there are a lot of questions about that. And us on the R&D team are more in the data than we are working directly with clients. But we will have a, a lot of really powerful stories that we'll be able to tell at that forum. So definitely hit that link that Nelly sent around. Yeah, thank you, Michael. And uh, as a housekeeping follow-up, we'll also be sharing the recording and the presentation with everyone who registered and joined us today. We can also include that link in that follow-up from our team. But big thank you to everyone. Thank you for your time. Hope the rest of your day, evening, morning is wonderful and uh, look forward to chatting with you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye, all.